you know, when people talk about these days and age, they're often referred to as the fourth industrial revolution. You do a different uh, description. You call it the new renaissance or the second renaissance. I guess it's more than a game of words, but it's also a conceptual issue. Can you explain what's behind that? The idea of a fourth industrial revolution is a powerful one. Uh, but I don't think that it's necessarily the best way of thinking about the time we live in. Um, this isn't the fourth industrial revolution. Um, it's not industrial. It's much broader. It's about social transformation. And it is a revolution, but it's very different to the industrial revolutions. The idea of the industrial revolution conjures up an idea that we're going to have more higher quality jobs at the end. Uh, I think that is very much a question uh, going forward. And it also suggests that in the end, everyone is better off. Uh, and I think that's also questionable. The other thing about the Industrial Revolution is, of course, that it percolated very slowly around the world. There's still parts of the world today which haven't been touched by the first Industrial Revolution. You see people pulling plows behind oxen in India, Africa, and elsewhere. What we're living through now is a global transformation which is very different, I think. And so I prefer the Renaissance analogy, not because history repeats itself, but I do think it rhymes. You can pick up clues <laughs> as to the way it will evolve. So for me, what's interesting is understanding how information revolutions lead to rapid change and how we need to manage them more effectively to ensure that we have a happier outcome uh, than the Renaissance. And for that reason, I prefer the analogy of our new age of discovery, our new Renaissance, to that of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. One of the characteristics of the Renaissance, as you mentioned, was an extreme pace in development and progress. And that same pace we're seeing today what do you think are the main consequences for companies to adapt to that change and what happens if they don't? The only thing that happens if you don't change is you get left behind more quickly. Change is not an option. Uh, if you don't change, you are very rapidly out of date. You will become a dinosaur. You will become extinct very quickly. The question is how do you change? Uh, making sure that you bring your whole company with you, that it's not just the board or the management that change and think the company is changing. And of course, it's not only changing in the way that we do things and the expectations of society, the expectations of employees as to what their firms have to offer, the dimensions of it on multiple levels, but also, of course, the products and services uh, and the markets, center of gravity moving to Asia, the role of the millennium, and the new demand, the whole digital economy, uh, the ways that social expectations have changed. We've seen with the Me Too movement, we've seen in many other ways on climate change, etc. That operating as if we can operate in a world of the uh, 20th century is going to be a disastrous track for any company. We need to uh, learn to adapt more effectively <coughs> And when societies change more quickly, uh, we need to ensure we are more flexible. Uh, that flexibility of the mind, that ability to adapt, the agility uh, that we need. And it's not going to slow down. Uh, this is going to be accelerating even more because there are more participants, there's more complexity, it's more confusing in terms of the signals. And so we need to be managers of uncertainty. We need to be able to surf the big waves uh, without coming off. And that requires, I think, a very different type of mindset, a very different type of skill set, an adaptability, an ability to listen, uh, which uh, managers are going to have to pick up. Mm -hmm.